Hey everyone, welcome. It is Sunday afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, or maybe morning, depending on where you are. It's four o'clock here in Southern California. What exciting times we have. Listen, before we, I, I forget, I want to make sure I say this. Happy Thanksgiving. It's coming Thursday, and I don't know about the place that you live in, but where I live, there are some really interesting uh, Thanksgiving rules that we're supposed to comply with, like um, make sure nobody uses the bathroom at your house, and if they do, you got to go through this whole on, uh, just make sure you, you sanitize the whole bathroom before it gets used to Kim. Uh, you got to eat outdoors. Uh, you have to uh, make sure that you write down everybody's name, I guess, so the state of California can track you or trace you and put you into their database. And who knows about a crazy things. Anyways, I can tell you this much. I'm celebrating Thanksgiving uh, with my whole family, and that's a large family. And there's going to be a lot more people than I'm supposed to have. Uh, it's going to be a happy Thanksgiving because uh, we are thankful uh, to the Lord. He is so good to us. And uh, listen, we know Jesus is coming, so without uh, uh, wasting any more time, let's get going with the message. And I want to continue with Daniel chapter 11. In fact, I'm going to be in Daniel for a few weeks before I have a guest again. And uh, in Daniel chapter 11, we're going to do a little bit of history, and then we're going to do a little bit about what's coming in the future uh, as far as the message right now tonight. Uh, but then uh, what is coming after that, we get into Daniel chapter 11 with the answer. Antichrist um, later on where he divides the land for gain. Um, he has no other God that he worships except the God of fortresses. Uh, so we're going to get into all of that next time. But right now, let's get a little bit of the history. Um, so let's get going. Daniel chapter 11. Uh, verse 4 tells us this as we look at this message, or verses 1 through 4, about the vile king. Uh, verses 1 through 4, Daniel chapter 11. In the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth uh, shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he is arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion, with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others besides these. Well, what in the world is going on here? Listen, this can seem a little bit confusing, and what's going to come in the next few verses can also seem confusing unless you take a few minutes to go through it, which we're going to do, and you're going to go, wow, this is absolutely amazing what was really going on here and what Daniel sees and then what transpires. But let's get the context of Daniel chapter 11. Remember where we were, Daniel chapter 10, last time we were in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel has his vision, he's praying, and, uh, and he's seeking the Lord. And the, uh, the answer is held up for 21 days. Um, you have the, the issue with the prince of Persia, the, the angel, the demon of, of Persia that holds up the angel being able to get to Daniel to tell him what in the world is going on. So we had that. And Daniel's given all these different visions, and, uh, he, and he's taken through this time in Daniel chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12. So that's what's going on here. Daniel's trying to make sense of things, but listen to this. Go back to Daniel chapter 10, and we have this. Uh, in the third year, listen to this, Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. Now listen to this. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and Daniel understood the message and had understanding of the vision. So what's happening here, Daniel's getting this, the message, he's getting the vision, he's able to understand it, and then he starts to tell us what in the world is going on. So that helps us to understand a little bit as we set the course for Daniel chapter 11. The first thing we note here, just two main points. Number one is the rejection of Bible prophecy. Listen. 
Daniel chapter 11 is one of the most hotly contested passages in the entire Bible, if not the most contested passages in the entire Bible, uh, saying, many scholars say that Daniel chapter 11 was written after the fact. Now, why do they say that? I'm going to show you why, and it's remarkable, but really, ultimately, it comes down to a spiritual battle. So notice this regarding the rejection of Bible prophecy. A, uh, prophecy uh, is something that the demons are unable to stop. Remember, Daniel chapter 10, already mentioned it, and you saw it last time we, when we were in the book of Daniel. Um, uh, Daniel had been fasting and praying for 21 days or three weeks. Uh, chapter 10 tells us, that, again, the angel was held up uh, coming to Daniel for those 21 days. Why? Because of the battle of angels and demons, the, the prince of Persia uh, and, uh, and the princes of per, uh, Greece and Persia. Actually, verse 20 of chapter 10 says this. He said, do you know why I I have come to you, Daniel, this angel talking to Daniel, and now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece is going to come. So we have this picture, this understanding, there's all kinds of spiritual battles that are going on, these demons that are fighting against the angel coming to Daniel to give him the answer, and now the angel says, look, I've got to go back, and I'm going to have to fight with the prince of this, this demon of Persia, and then after that, the demon of Greece is going to come for me. So Daniel, anyways, I came to you to tell you what's going on, but when I leave here, it's going to get ugly for me again in the prophetic realm. I think this is absolutely fascinating, but ultimately, these prophecies here are regarding prophecies of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. Look at chapter 10, verse 14. In fact, before we go there, you might be wondering, well, if we're in chapter 11 in this message tonight, why are we going back to chapter 10? Because there's no way you can understand chapter 11 without being reminded of what was taking place in chapter 10. Hence, you got this demonic realm, these battles going on, the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, this angel angel coming to Daniel, uh, the and the prophecies regarding Israel and the Jewish people up until the time of the end. So with that, go back to chapter 10, verse 14, to help us make sense of everything going on. Now I have come to make you understand, the angel says to Daniel, what will happen to your people, that's the Jewish people, in the latter days, in the last days. Listen, these are the days that are coming, I believe, in the immediate future. We are so close to the fulfillment of these prophecies. I will tell you what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Wow. Um, the main prophecy from the vision. Again, you're going to have these, these prophetic visions from Daniel that cover chapter 10, 11, and 12. And the main prophecies, um, uh, besides the fact that the Messiah is going to return, there's going to be a millennial kingdom that's going to be set up. We get to that in chapter 12, is this. Uh, these prophecies lay out for us the long, great struggle for the Jews and for Israel. Let me go back one more time to chapter 10. This is the last time we're going back to chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 1, the message was true, but the appointed time was long. And Daniel understood the message and an understanding of the vision. The message is true regarding the people of Israel and the nation of Israel, but the message was long. What does that mean? A long, great struggle for the Jews in Israel. Now look also at verse 14 again. I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days from now, the long, great struggle for the Jews and for Israel. I look at this and think how this has happened for the nation of Israel right up until where we are today, uh, right now, giving the events going on in America right now. Uh, listen, last time when we were in chapter 10, I laid out a lot of the historical things that have happened to the nation of Israel and the Jewish people and the anti-Semitism. And then we look where we are today, uh, right now in America. We have our election a mess that is continuing. And then we have... Uh, 
uh, Biden's own cabinet, uh, Biden himself, that is saying, uh, uh, he's saying, well, he doesn't say if he becomes president. As far as they can see and the mainstream media can see, he is the president. He's already trying to act like the president or people on his behalf. But they're making it clear, listen, if Biden becomes president, he is going to enter back into the agreement, the failed nuclear agreement with Iran, a.k.a. Persia. He's going to enter into that, and it's, it's very clear. Iran is going to uh, just continue to press forward with their nuclear plans, and Israel is saying, look, we're going to end up in a war with Iran if Biden becomes president, and this is going to get ugly. But when you look at what's going on right now in the United States, you look what's going on with Israel, you look at what's going on with Iran, with Turkey, and with Russia, you look at what's going on in the battle that is, that is I believe, uh, the framework is all being laid out right now. The, the groundwork is all being laid out right now for the Ezekiel 38 battle. You look what's going on with Libya. You look what's going on with Sudan. All of those things regarding the Ezekiel 38 war. And now we have a Biden presidency, uh, or, or if Biden were to become president, he says, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be uh, we're going to be strengthening the Palestinian cause, which means we're going to be strengthening Hamas and Hezbollah. As far as I can see, these terrorist organizations, and at the same time, what's going on with Iran? And you look at this, and you go, "Wow, that fits perfectly with what Daniel says: the long, great struggle for the Jews in Israel, right up to and including the tribulation period." Uh, so let's get going a little bit further. So we have uh, regarding prophecy: the demons are unable to stop it; they're unable to stop the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. A lot of the Bible prophetic things they actually like, like the destruction of Israel. However, what they uh, what they uh, don't really quite understand that you can understand if you read the Bible is Jesus wins. Um, they may read it. Oh, Satan may read the word, and he's thinking, okay, it says here uh, the Messiah, uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, is going to uh, win in the end, but Satan is going to do every single thing that he can to thwart it, but it is not going to work. Uh, the demons are unable to stop the ultimate fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and B, men do their best to get rid of Bible prophecy. Why is that? It is a spiritual battle, and the evidence of the truth of Bible prophecy prophecy in the past that's been fulfilled, prophecy yet in the future, the evidence of of, uh, uh, of the fact that the, it gives evidence to the fact that the Bible is true and men try to get rid of it. Consider this, pastor and Bible teacher David Jeremiah writes, a professor in his commentary on Daniel, writes, a professor at a liberal theological seminary was teaching from the book of Daniel. His class consisted of young men and women, many of them future church leaders. At the beginning of the lecture, he said, now I want you to understand that Daniel was written during the Maccabean period in the second century BC, not by the historic Daniel who lived in the sixth century BC. The facts were written as all history is after the events took place. So did you get that? This seminary professor says, Daniel's not prophetic. Uh, he comes along 400 years later, and he looks back at what takes place in Daniel chapter 11, where we are right now tonight. He looks back at Daniel chapter 11 and writes it down because he's able to see it from a historical perspective historical perspective. It'd be like me living today, writing back uh, um, and saying, uh, back when Ronald Reagan became president and the different things that happened during the Reagan presidency. And then as if I subscribed my name to Bible prophecy, uh, writing backwards on that. The problem with that, that teaching is that's not what happened here. Daniel is writing to what is coming in the future 400 years before it happened uh, it, regarding Daniel chapter 11, this, Bible prof, this, this, this uh, seminary professor says, that ain't so. He's not writing prophetically. He is writing from a perspective that looks back at history. However, there's a problem. One of the young men in his class, he raised his hand and he says, sir, how can it be when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, that this book was written by Daniel the prophet? In other words, speaking of the future things that were to come, the professor paused for a moment. He looked at the student in the eyes and he said, young man, 
I know more about the book of Daniel than Jesus did. You look at that and you go, this is just unbelievable. But this is the thought process in many churches today. This is the thought process in seminaries even today. And and, uh, as you think of this, uh, so this happened several years ago. These young men that were in that class are now out there leading churches and many of them are teaching the same thing. Hence, this is where we are today when we find out what is being taught in pulpits that you can't really believe Bible prophecy. It's just a bunch of hogwash. Here's the deal. Bible prophecy proves that the Bible is true. You can believe it or not believe it, just like any part of the Word of God. But by rejecting the Word of God, you're the one that's going to suffer the consequences. Listen, the Bible is true. And regarding Bible prophecy... There's a couple of different things to keep in mind. There's fulfilled Bible prophecy, and there is unfulfilled Bible prophecy. Um, what we're reading and looking at in this evening's message is fulfilled Bible prophecy with a projection to some of the unfulfilled things. In other words, Daniel is writing regarding fulfilled prophecy, what was going to come in 200 years, 300 years, 400 years. He's writing that. Uh, in chapter 11, the the first part of chapter 11. And then, now we look back and we go, wow, that was fulfilled exactly as Daniel said it would be. In these verses, note there are two parts of fulfilled Bible prophecy. There is, one, the prophecy regarding Persia, uh, modern-day Iran. Daniel was living during the time of uh, the Persians when King Cyrus had uh, decreed uh, the return of the Jews to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem. And remember, the angel of the Lord is now t- telling Daniel what will come in, uh, when he looks into the future from his perspective. Verse 2 again tells us this. Look at this, verse 2. And now I will tell you the truth. So the angel's not lying. Listen, I'm telling you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Daniel is so accurate, again, that seminary professors even today are saying there's no way Daniel could have written that. Listen, God tells us then from the beginning. We'll look at that in just a second. But Daniel is told here, listen Daniel, I know what's going on there. You're still in Babylon, but I want you to know there are four more Persian kings that are coming, and when the fourth one comes, he's going to be richer than all of the rest. By the way, the fourth one that's spoken of here in Daniel chapter 2 is Xerxes or Ahasuerus. He's the king that is mentioned in the book of Esther, and he had a great army, and as verse 2 says, he, he tries to go up against the realm of Greece, but we know from history he was routed, he was shut down. After After he passed away, verse 3 tells us there was a mighty king that arose. So we have the prophecy regarding Persia. We also have the prophecies regarding Greece. Uh, The mighty king from verses 3 and 4 in Daniel chapter 11 is the one that is known as Alexander the Great. Uh, Look at this, verses 3 and 4. Then a mighty king shall arise against this is Alexander the Great, who shall rule with a great dominion and do according to his will. Alexander the Great, you look back at history, listen, uh, read some of the things about him. It is unbelievable the power that he had, and at such a young age too. And when he has arisen, look at this verse 4, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided in, uh, divided toward the four winds of heaven. In other words, there's going to be four different kingdoms that Alexander the Great's kingdom is going to be split to. And then it says this, uh, it's going to be divided to the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. This is really interesting. Um, 
his kingdom wasn't going to be given to his own family. Uh, we've seen a little bit of this before, uh, but verse 4 is referring to the fact that his sons and his brother uh, would not receive the kingdom of Alexander the Great. In fact, his sons and his brother were murdered shortly after Alexander uh, died. As such, his kingdom was divided into the hands of his four generals, just as verse 3 said it would be divided to uh, the, towards the four winds. So again, uh, men say there's no way that Daniel could have been written prophetically looking to what was coming in the future. He had to be looking past to what had already been fulfilled. <laughs> Not so. Listen, this is Daniel's pen writing through what God has shown him and the visions that he's given him. And then the angel gives him the understanding. Daniel, write this down. Listen, this is what God does. He tells us, uh, Isaiah chapter 4. 46 says, God himself says, I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none besides me. Uh, Isaiah 46 goes on and says, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Listen, God knows the future and he told Daniel what the future would be. And, and you look at this, God does these things. He gives us the prophetic word so that we can know it is true. And when you look at fulfilled prophecy like this, it, God wants us to understand. But prophecy, listen, demons don't want us to understand. And men um, look at this and say, this is impossible. Uh, you can't understand Bible prophecy. You can't actually believe in the prophetic things. Nobody can do that. But this is God we're talking about. God tells us the way it's going to go. He wants us to have understanding. Jesus tells us to watch and be ready. We don't have all these hundreds of prophecies regarding the second coming of Christ that are found throughout the entire Bible. Uh, God didn't give us those just to play a game with us and say, ah, this stuff's not really going to come true. I just wanted to mess with humanity, uh, the whole thing. I, was, I just made up a bunch of stuff. No, he gave us those things so that we would know. And when we look at the prophecies fulfilled here regarding Persia and Greece and Alexander the Great, and in just a couple of minutes, Antiochus Epiphanes, you look, you go, those prophecies that were given by Daniel and then fulfilled after Daniel died, give us they strengthen our faith to re and they remind us God's word is true. You can trust it with the second coming of Christ. Hence, you can trust it with the first coming of Christ. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. We can trust God in all of his word. If you can't trust God in his word, then how can you trust him for the forgiveness of your sins? Ah, but we know Christ has forgiven us. And we have the prophetic word that proves his word is always true. So, number one, we have the rejection of Bible prophecy. Number two, just the second main point, as I mentioned, only two main points in this message tonight, is the rejection of Bible prophecy uh, doesn't make Bible prophecy not true. Verses 5 and 6. We're not going to read all these verses, just so you know. Uh, but in verses 5 and 6, also the king of the south, uh, this is going to start getting to sound a little bit strange here, but it's all right. When you get this, which is just going to be a couple of more minutes, you're going to go, wow, that is incredible. Look at this. Also, the king of the south shall, come and str uh, shall become strong as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And the end of some years... At the end of some years, they shall join forces for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of her authority and neither he nor his authority shall stand. But she shall be given up with those who brought her and with him who begot her and with him who strengthened her in those times. What in the world is going on with this? I'm going to explain this to you in just a second, but before, because it is just wild. And when you read this, you go, man, this doesn't even make any sense. Oh, it's going to make sense in just a second. Believe me, it is going to make sense. But I want to show you this before we move on. Re being reminded this, first of all, rejection of Bible prophecy doesn't make Bible prophecy not true. 
Men don't want you to believe Bible prophecy. The demons certainly don't want you to be, believe Bible prophecy. But because people reject it doesn't mean it's not true. It is absolutely true. But consider this, with this thought in mind, the Bible tells us, in the last days, scoffers will come, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Uh, uh, walking according to their own lusts. Where is saying, where's the promises of his coming? For this, they willfully forget. Listen, let me read that passage to you from 2 Peter chapter 3 in its context. So this says this, 2 Peter chapter 3, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their lust, saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This is this thought, since the the fathers fell asleep. Everything continues as they are. The thought behind this that's inferred here is these are people who are raised in the church and they say, well, my dad used to tell us Jesus is coming, but everything's continuing just as they are. Listen, yeah, we're in a pandemic. We've been in pandemics before. Blah, 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 blah. Everything's going to continue. My grandpa used to say Jesus was coming. My dad used to tell me that. I don't want to hear that anymore. That's what's happening here. Scoffers will come and say, see, I took this Bible prophecy stuff, you can't believe it. Then it says this, for this, look at this, verse 5, they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that had then existed perished, being flooded with the water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So we have this prophetic word. For this they willfully forget. There really was creation, and guess what? A one day there really is going to be a judgment that is coming again. And then you drop down, uh, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, wow, looking for, being excited and encouraged that Jesus is coming again. Wow, so he lays out the prophetic word. Scoffers are going to say this Bible prophecy stuff ain't never going to be fulfilled. The scoffers will say, Daniel wasn't really writing about anything in the future. He was looking back at the past and, and, and some guy penned these words and put Daniel's name on it. Ha! Their scoffers will come. But this they willfully forget. That is a determined ignorance. They choose to ignore the truth of the facts. They choose to ignore the prophetic word has always been true, and it will be again. They also choose to ignore, talking about here specifically, not just prophecy, but also the creation of the world. They choose to uh, ig ignore the facts that evolution isn't real. It really doesn't happen. Just ignore this and ignore that. They are willfully ignorant when presented with the facts. If the facts don't line up with what they want to believe, then they reject them and they say, you just can't believe it. Listen, ignoring the truth doesn't make the truth go away. Judgment will still come to those who reject him. But here, regarding this whole passage and this let me tell you this gets really really fascinating right here in verses 5 and 6 we are told some more prophetic and biblical truth as we are introduced into a the king of the south verse 5 and b the king of the north in verse 6 so let me understand uh, let me summarize this so we don't get too overwhelmed with this to help us understand so these two kings the king of the north and the king of the south they're constantly at each other's throats. Uh, in those days, uh, kings had an interesting way of handling disagreements. If you were a king and you were not getting along uh, with the neighboring king, but you needed that king's favor, you would offer your daughter 
That's right. You would offer your daughter to be the other king's wife as a form of a peace treaty. So that's why you read here in verses 5 and 6, you're reading about this. The king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of her authority. What is all this about? Uh, and neither he nor his authority shall stand, but she shall be given up. So it's talking about these peace agreements uh, that they used to do at, the, at that time. Uh, consider this also. Um, we have this, this, this uh, uh, attempt at the peace agreement between the king of the north and the king of the south. Um, uh, by the way, what you're looking at there, the king of the north would be the area of Syria and then some of the greater, more encompassing areas of Syria that are surrounding Syria today. The king of the south would be the king of Egypt. Uh, they're not getting along. They're looking to, uh, to try and do some type of peace agreement. Listen, some things never change. Here we are 2,400 years later. You're looking 2,500 years later and you're looking going well this is really interesting Daniel wrote these prophecies and then uh, but these prophecies are going to be fulfilled uh, as you look at the kingdoms that were coming uh, the kingdom of Greece being split up very fascinating things that are happening here in Daniel chapter 11 2400 2500 2200 years 2300 years ago uh, written and uh, but still the same today uh, the kings of Syria, the kings of Egypt, not getting along, different peace agreements, fascinating things to, uh, to look at and uh, to talk about. But the king of the north, the king of Syria, called himself uh, Antiochus the God. Do you think he had a big ego? He did. Listen. This whole chapter reads like a, like a, a soap opera. The king of the north, Antiochus the god, got into one of those peace treaties with the king of the south, the king of, e of Egypt, right, where you give your daughter away to enter into this peace agreement. As such, the king of the north was to marry the daughter of the king of the south. But there was one small problem. The king of the north was already married. He, f uh, he fixed that. And he divorced his wife and he married the better looking and younger uh, young daughter of the king of the south. So the first wife of Antiochus, the god, uh, the king of the north, didn't like that one bit. So she had a, a, his new wife and all of her ser uh, servants murdered. Uh, no problem, thought the king. So he takes his wife back. Now, the, the humor in this is that he calls himself Antiochus the God. He couldn't foresee all these different problems that were going to come about when he divorces his wife. Says, hey, here's this younger looking girl here. I'll take her. This is going to be great. I mean, he wasn't really thinking through the whole thing. Right? So his ex-wife kills his wife, and it kills his new younger wife that's the daughter of the, the other king. Man, what a soap opera. Now, get this. So he says, I'm going to marry my first wife, the one who just killed my new wife. So he remarries here, being Antiochus the god. If he really was a god, he would have thought through this whole thing. It didn't work out so well for him. Uh, as soon as they were remarried, she dealt with Antiochus the god, and she poisoned him. So that didn't go too well for, uh, for him at all. Uh, just a little bit of a lesson there. Uh, just to stick with things the way that God wants us to live. You'll probably do a lot better. Anyways, that's what verses 5 and 6 are all about. This, this, this daughter, the trading, uh, the peace agreements, and the whole, the whole bit. Uh, but let's move on because it, it doesn't get any less interesting. Um, verse 7 says, I'm not going to read all of this, by the way, but from a branch of her roots, uh, one shall arise in this place who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail. What is this about? The brother of the murdered Egyptian princess, right? So the king of the north marries this young daughter of the Egyptian king. So the bro and she's the one that's murdered by the ex-wife of Antiochus the god. Okay, you following all that? Okay. Now, uh, um, the brother of the murdered Egyptian princess is ticked off. His sister's murdered. So he starts a war with the king of the north. Uh, Egypt and Syria are at each other's throats. Um, and, and guess what? Uh, the battle is fought on Israel's land. That is why, by the way, this is included in Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy is Israel-centric. And uh, 
So it's included here. In fact, uh, as you look at Bible prophecy in this, it just fits with the continued long, great struggle of the nation of Israel that is going to continue right up until the time of Armageddon when Jesus returns and he casts the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire forever and ever. And then Jesus rules and reigns uh, from Jerusalem uh, and the millennial kingdom begins. That happens in chapter 12. Let me stick with chapter 11 here. Now check this out. Uh, This gets even weirder. In verses 10 through 19, again, I'm not going to read all of this, but some time has passed, and uh, there is another strong king from the north, and he attempts to control both the north and the south. Uh, The new uh, king of the north, his name, he calls himself Antiochus the Great. So we go from a king who calls himself Antiochus the God, now we have Antiochus the Great. They all had egos. He attacks Egypt with his army of 75,000 soldiers, and he stomps through Israel to get there. The king of Egypt retaliates, get this, with 73,000 soldiers, 5,000 cavalry, and 73 elephants. Uh, So the elephants themselves were used as battering rams. Now we can imagine what it was like for Israel being caught in the middle of all these wars and now there's elephants that are that are (laughs) that are running through uh, the land of Israel. Gabe you've been to Israel before can you imagine (laughs) I've <laughs> seen all these elephants just running through there. Uh, anyways, it's the interesting thing. So Antiochus the Great, the king of the north, so he's the new king. So Antiochus the God is dead. Antiochus the Great, the king of the north, was not to be outdone by all those elephants. In the verses 13 through 15 of chapter 11, uh, you'll find, if you have an opportunity to read it later, that he would muster up an army that was larger than his first army, and he defeats the king of the south. And then in verse 16, he makes a new home in the glorious land, verse 16 tells us, or the beautiful land, which is Israel, which was just run over by all those elephants. Now, Antiochus the Great uh, still isn't happy, even though he now has victory. He was determined to not just defeat Egypt, the king of the south, but to unite them as one. So what did he need to do? He needed a peace treaty. So how do you have a peace treaty? You guessed it. Uh, He offered up one of his daughters that was very attractive, and that is what is taking place in verse 17. Verse 17 says this, He shall also set his face to enter uh, with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright, uh, upright ones with him. Thus he shall do, and he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it, but he shall not stand with him or be for him. Wow! So he's going to offer up his daughter. Now check this out. King Antiochus the Great, he's not so great either. Just like Antiochus the God wasn't really a god, Antiochus the Great, he's not so great. Antiochus the Great, by giving his daughter to the king of the south, intended that she would be a spy for him on the inside of the palace. That's why verse 17 says what it says. Look it up again yourself. It is fascinating. But guess what happened? So he gives up his daughter. She's going to be a spy for him. But she fell in love with the king of the south. It didn't go go the way that daddy had planned. Daddy thought she'd be a spy. Didn't work out. Daddy was mad. Hence the prophecy of verse 18. After this, he's furious. Antiochus, the the great is who's not so great. He is furious. Verse 18, after this, uh, because his daughter, he feels he's, he's been betrayed by his own daughter. After this, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall take many. But a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end. With the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. History shows us that this was filled to a T, this prophecy was. Antiochus, the great, headed towards the coastlands, which was Greece, but the Roman armies that were on the ascension stood in his way and he was routed. For the second time, um, his plan was thwarted. History tells us. So the first time, here's my plan. My daughter's going to marry the king. That didn't work out so well. I thought she'd be a spy. She falls in love with the king. Now he's turning his his attention to the coastlands. That doesn't work out for him either. Uh, History tells us that he then went back to his own cities and tried to plunder the temple of Jupiter. 
but he didn't care what was in his own way, even if it was uh, his own people. He saw what he wanted, and he tried to get, get it by whatever means he could. His own people were so angry at him that they murdered him. Hence, verse 19 says, Then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. So Antiochus the Great was not so great. He was defeated. He was forgotten. It's a reminder that there's only one great one, and that is the king of all kings, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the next king after him didn't last long. He imposed heavy taxes on the people, um, but then he died, as verse 20 tells us. After that appears to him, the last one we're going to look at tonight, uh, in fact, this part's going to be real short, because this is where the most intriguing part begins. In fact, some of the most uh, intriguing parts of Bible prophecy, right up to the days that we live in, begin with this next person. Remember, we have Antiochus the God, he's dead. Then there's Antiochus the Great, he's dead. Enter in the next Antiochus. Who do we have? Epiphanes. Now, it's important to understand some of the things going on about Epiphanes. I'm going to read some of these verses, and then we're going to wrap it up, because this is going to take us into the future uh, in just a couple of minutes. Verse 21, in his place, you have all these other guys that have died before him, the other Antiochuses and so forth. In his place shall arise a vile person, to whom uh, they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. He is a vile person, this Antiochus Epiphanes. With the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. And after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and be str become strong with a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, the spoil, the riches, and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds. But only for a time he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him, his army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table, but it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant. He shall do damage and return to his own land. So what in the world is going on here? Well, let's think about this. Again, this is only going to take a couple more minutes. We're almost done. But there's fulfilled prophecy. We already understand what fulfilled prophecy is. Uh, so far, everything we've covered in chapter 11 is prophecy that has been fulfilled. And then there is unfulfilled prophecy prophecy. Unfulfilled prophecy is this. In Daniel chapter 11, it is everything after verse 35. We're not going all the way through to verse 35 today. We're stopping actually uh, right where we are, verse 28. So you have fulfilled prophecy. It's prophecy that was given, but we look back in uh, history and we say that was fulfilled. Unfulfilled prophecy is everything that's coming in the future. But is there another type? Yes, there is. There's dual fulfilled prophecy. What is that? When you look at Antiochus Epiphanes, so much of his character and the things he did uh, fit into not just fulfilled prophecy, but unfulfilled prophecy, hence dual fulfilled prophecy. Um, it was, it, what this means is it was fulfilled in history past, but it will be fulfilled in its ultimate in someone else in another time. Let me give you an example. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Uh, Jesus is talking in verse 15. He's talking about the abomination of desolations, and he says, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Uh, what was Jesus referring to? 
uh, we have two different things. He's referring to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel chapter 9 is prophesying about the Antichrist, where he is going to commit the abomination of desolations. That is a future prophecy, not yet fulfilled. It's unfulfilled. It's going to happen during the tribulation period. However, with Antiochus Epiphanes, this is what we find out. He is a type of Antichrist. He fulfilled a, a, the abomination of desolation, an abomination of desolation, but also he was a type of Antichrist. And in that sense, you can say there's a dual fulfilled Bible prophecy that the same type of thing is going to happen again with the Antichrist in the future. I hope that makes sense to you, but there is, you see a lot of this with Antiochus Epiphanes. He has this. Um, uh, this the anti, If you want to know what Antichrist is going to look like, you go back and look at Antiochus Epiphanes, what he did in the past, and you go, yikes. Okay, so let, let me give you just one example with Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, you know what this is? Hanukkah. Uh, Hanukkah is coming up. Uh, what is Hanukkah? Well, here's what happened with Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes, he committed the abomination of desolation. Some historians tell us that he took the blood of pigs and uh, plastered it all over the, uh, the holy place in Jerusalem in the temple, desecrated the temple. Antiochus Epiphanes was a very, very evil person. Um, but there's the Maccabean Revolt. And, when, and uh, I'm not going to get into the Maccabean Revolt or what Hanukkah is all about. But during the Maccabean Revolt, they need to cleanse the temple so they could have the temple back after they were able to get rid of Antiochus Epiphany. So what did they do? They, uh, they um, had some oil, but they didn't have enough oil to last for the eight days that were necessary for the cleansing of the holy place. Uh, but there was a miracle. Uh, the oil, the little bit of oil that they had did last for the eight days. And hence we have the celebration of Hanukkah or the Festival of the Lights. In fact, if you look back on the picture again, Gabe, can you pull that picture back up? You'll notice on this, uh, this, this is called a Hanukkah, you have uh, four uh, candles on each side uh, with the servant candle in the middle. A uh, typical menorah has three on each side. The reason why the Hanukkah has the four on each side, a total of eight, is commemorating the eight days that the, the lamps were able to burn in order to cleanse the temple when Antiochus Epiphanes had committed the uh, abomination of desolation during his time. Hence, a dual fulfillment, as I mentioned. You have fulfilled prophecy, unfulfilled prophecy. And in a case like this, we have the dual fulfilled prophecy. As such, Antiochus Epiphanes is a type of the Antichrist. Last couple of things, we'll wrap this up. A, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was a vile person, so too will uh, um, Antichrist be a vile person. Antiochus Epiphanes in verse 21 of Daniel, he is called uh, the vile, uh, a vile person. Um, I'm not going to get into the gross things that he did to the Jewish people when he, uh, walk, when he marched into Jerusalem and just come, started to destroy them. It was horrific. I don't want to talk about it. Um, you think of some of the things that took place in the Nazi death camps, and, and you look at the things that Antiochus did, very similar, just gross, gross, gross things. However, Antiochus Epiphanes is a type of Antichrist, and Antichrist will also be a vile person. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus speaking in the Olivet Discourse, after he talks about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Matthew 24, verse 15, Jesus then says this, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Antiochus was a vile person. Antichrist, it's hard to believe, is going to be even worse than Antiochus Epiphanes was. Absolutely horrible. Uh, so Antiochus was a vile person. Antichrist will be a vile person. Uh, Antiochus came in peace. So too will Antichrist come in 
peace. Antiochus reigned from 175 to 164 BC. He had no legitimate claim to the throne. His older brother named uh, Demetrius was the previous king. Demetrius died and one of his sons should have risen to the position of king. But just as verse 21 says, Antiochus seized his kingdom peaceably and by intrigue, by political maneuvering and brokering peace between people, Antiochus became king. That is the same thing that's going to happen with Antichrist. It's going to be this political brokering and maneuvering. Antiochus was known for intrigue and for flatteries. Um, he flattered the Romans. He flattered the king of Pergamos. He flattered Attalus and anyone else that was necessary in order to attain the title of king. So too, when you look at the characteristics of Antichrist. Uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. By peace, he's going to destroy many. You see him in Revelation chapter 6. He's riding on the white horse, a bow without arrows. He's coming in. He's got intrigue. We know from various passages in the Bible. He's just loaded with flattery. He's got this most incredible, winsome personality this world has ever seen before. And everybody is believing him and everybody's receiving him. Listen, when Jesus came, he was rejected, but he warned there's one who's coming who you will receive. He's of the devil himself. He's going to come in his own name. He's of the devil himself. Later on in chapter 11, we're going to find out that he's, the Antichrist is going to worship the God of fortresses. Uh, and we're going to go right on down this list and see what is coming and the characteristics. But this is what he was. He's a vile person, uh, and he comes in peace, and he comes in flattery. He comes in and intrigue and people just fall down and they're going to worship him listen we're going to wrap it up right here and uh and we'll, we're going to pick up here next time um, because there are absolutely fascinating things to see for what is coming. And I, listen, we're going to understand why we are where we are in the world right now. I'm going to connect those dots next time. It'll be a prophecy update coupled here with Daniel chapter 11, Antiochus Epiphanes, and the Antichrist. But we need to remember this. Uh, we can have somebody calls himself Antiochus the God. Somebody calls himself Antiochus the Great. Somebody calls himself Antiochus Epiphanes. And... and uh, oh, Men can call themselves whatever they want to, but there's only one true God and one true King. Uh, he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Listen, Jesus is coming again. I want to ask you this, as you look at all the events that are going on in the world, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen, if you don't know Jesus, ask him to forgive you of your sins, and also re you need to repent of your sins. The Bible tells us so. What is to repent? To repent is to turn from your sins and surrender to Christ. It's to make a U-turn, a conscious decision, to turn from your sin and surrender to Christ. Listen, ask him uh, right now, admit you're a sinner right now. Ask him to forgive you and repent. In fact, pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner and ask that you'll forgive me of my sins. And right now, I repent of my sin and unbelief and I surrender to you as Lord. I thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, if you prayed that and you meant it, I'm going to ask you, you can email me. You can email me through uh, my website, hopeforourtimes.com. And I want to thank you for uh, being with me tonight. Until next time, happy Thanksgiving. We will celebrate. We will thank the Lord. Amen. And keep your head up. Jesus is coming. God bless.